spine surgeon and you'll understand more about that at the end I hope um, please forgive this talk it's not supposed to be egocentric but the only way to describe the perils I felt was to describe them as they sort of happened to me as we went along as part of my learning curve now Don Quixote was not too much of a fan of uh, technology because I think he felt it undermined the cheval chivalric code chivalric code and uh, noblesse oblige and whilst the world is moving forwards with innovations at incredible exponential speeds there's still a lot of people who feel threatened by it or don't like it and it may be because they can't always access it but surgeons are a particular group which are rather reticent and I think it comes about because of our Hippocratic Oath which says please or no it doesn't say please it says first do no harm and of course if you've learnt tricks of surgery from a master before you you tend to stay with that because you know what it can do rather than you venture into unknown territory which might put your patients at harm but here is a little girl delighted to be receiving a, a new arm and that's made by a 3d printer so it could be built in poor countries this little girl with thalidomide has now got two arms that make her look absolutely the same as everybody else. And this is amazing. This is a functional hand where the nerve fibers fire tiny little muscle fibers, which increase the electrical amplitude, which is picked up by the prosthesis. So the brain is actually controlling that hand. And allowing them to do some really very intricate uh, maneuvers that may not look very intricate but it is if you think about how he's picking up not crushing it and placing it and this in particular where he doesn't knock it over so it doesn't uh, stop there obviously amputations are horrendous business but it must be something to be able to catwalk like that. I fancy, almost fancy it for myself. And of course, um, we have controversial uses of these amputational devices. This young lady is running extremely fast. Ah, oh, wait a minute, that's not right. And this I found amazing. Robotics. When Ian first saw this, he said, is there a human in that? But no, that is a complete robot. I'm not sure I could spring and do all that he's about to do like that. So I expect to see him dancing shortly. He is somewhat heavy, I think. And of course, these are amazing and great until they, I suppose, they become weaponized. Now, this chap has obviously watched me coming home on a Friday night. But the fact that he can adapt to rough ground and especially when you see him almost fall over yet correct is incredible technology whoops there we go so he's the smaller brother of the first one you saw but isn't this interesting they've got such brilliant technology but they must have decided that he shouldn't put his arms out to stop his fall lest he breaks the arms so I'm going to move on from that because I'm aware of time. Uh, he's got a mind of his own, this fella. And just like us, did you see him lean forwards? So. 
So moving on to the other extreme, speed. This is uh, Ch Charles Jean Taud uh, from Paris, who was a coach builder who made the first world speed record, as far as I can find out, in an electric car at the amazing speed of 39 miles an hour. And a year later, he upped that to 57 miles an hour in a much more carriage-like device. Now, as you know, here in Britain, we've not been short in uh, going for the land speed record, or all sorts of speed records. And here is Bluebird with Donald Campbell. And the, this managed to get through 404, and there's somebody in the audience who's going to correct me if I've got that wrong, miles an hour on Lake Erie in Australia. And it would have probably gone through 450 miles an hour had the salt flats not been flooded. And of course, uh, Donald was instrumental in bringing that enormous project to fruition. The Challenger 2 gets up to, and just double checking, 448 miles an hour and is piston driven. The SSC at the top right there is really just a jet, to, a double jet. And that actually gets up to 763 and that gets through the sound barrier. And the Venturi EV4, we don't need to worry so much about speed, but the fact that it has enormous acceleration and gets up to high speed and is entirely electric. So that's the beginning of, if you like, the new era. So technology has come to help us here in Tenterton. And this is Jenny and I getting ready to go shopping uh, for some essentials. So um, necessity is the innovation driver, isn't it? So here this little bunch got together, but nobody bought a ball, and that was the start of headhunting. Not all experiments go entirely according to plan, as you'll see, and we have to be careful into whose hands we place our inventions, and we really ought not to be too, um, too, too enthusiastic about our uh, activities. So I had a marvelous example to follow. My father was one of the first of five, the five neurosurgeons in the world, and in those days they were cutting off the front of people's brains to take away their terrible depression left them as a vegetable, but he invented stereotactic yttrium seed ablation, which meant a tiny little tract could be put into the brain, and it required it to go into area 13, which was said to be the fatal area. If anybody touched that, the patient would die. He found it didn't when he worked on some monkeys and then developed this technique, and as thought, thought of as the father of psychosurgery and deep brain surgery. But it was then that I saw that he had a battle on his hand because the psychiatrist still wanted to use electrical restarting of the brain called ECT. And instead, this is stereotactic surgery being performed these days and with the laser, as you'll see in just a moment. And it's being used to treat Parkinsonism and many other problems inside the brain. And of course, my father was doing this before there were MRI scans and CT scans. So I had a lot to live up to. One of the things he taught me was nobody invents. They only discover what's already out there. But he did indicate that the pioneer's pathway is often stony, always humbling and often lonely. So if we can just get that to move on. I thought we'd look at my personal development as the uh, matrix of this talk. And that will include a little bit of uplift on spinal anatomy, conventional spinal surgery, and the hurdles we faced in developing laser disc decompression and foraminoplasty. And it shows my transition from complete naivety you may not see that, um, and the repeated challenge of the establishment. 
which I'm told that repeatedly hitting your head against a brick wall is a sign of madness, and I'm sure you've already reached that decision about me. So I trained at St. Bartholomew's and became a registered surgeon by 1974. That's the Henry VIII gate on the left, the fountain square in the middle, which in my day was filled with the consultants Rolls Royces. And I got married for the first time in that church. My postgraduate training took place at the Royal Postgraduate Medical School and I can't recognize myself in that picture. I've got hair. And I set up there under my boss a fibrinolysis, fibrinolysis lab that was looking at the way in which clots dissolve and also form. And what we found was uh, that a group of patients, just as you're seeing with COVID, a group of patients have a very big outpouring of fibrinolytic uh, enzymes and then they deplete and they become vulnerable to clotting and then embolism which kills you when it runs into the chest. So in those days people were trying to squeeze the legs in order to make the blood move out of the legs and stop you forming a clot but we found that in cancer patients it didn't work as well as in ordinary patients. So it can't just be a problem with the turgidity of blood flow. And in fact, we squeeze people's arms and reduce their incidence of thrombosis, which in such a holistic system as the human body is quite amazing. And we got an inkling of what was going on when the rubidium krypton generator started up in this hospital. It was brand new, was, nobody else in the world had it. And when we were scanning, we found people had clots in their lungs before surgery. And it was some of these clots that got bigger after surgery. So squeezing the arms and pushing fibrinolytic enzymes into the chest was a way in which it was starting to control bad things from happening. So, um, I was privileged to be invited to go to St. Thomas's to join the orthopaedic training program, uh, partly because they wanted somebody who was interested in research. I think that's the only reason. And I looked at things. I thought it was a bit daft putting all this metal and plastic into people because metal is a hundred times stronger than bone. And uh, the, the, the plastic that we, uh, I shouldn't say stronger because one of your uh, you engineers is going to have me for that, but I'll come back on that in a second. But the uh, flexibility, if you like, of the plastic that we use to secure these devices was an order of 10 different yet again. And so I thought, well, why can't we try and emulate nature and make a living joint? And we laid up lots of different forms of carbon fiber and found a layup and a type of bonding that would allow tissue to grow in and form bone and come out onto the surface and form fibre cartilage. And in fact, we were working with the Atomic Weapons Research Establishment uh, using bits of their uh, unused nose cone. So it had some use. And to do this, we had to uh, design instruments to do a hip replacement because you are talking about 40 years ago. Um, in a lovely greyhound. The greyhounds came to us in the most awful state and we looked after them for three months, got them back to being healthy. And then they spent six months happily running up and down the stairs from the embankment to the Rain Institute. And indeed the bone had grown in and the fibre cartilage onto the surface. So I thought we had something of use and I went to Biomet, big American company, and said, hey, would you like to try and put this into humans? I think it could help. And they said, oh, gee, that's, that's really interesting. Why don't you put our device in? And that was a solid carbon fiber device. And I said, no, please don't. Uh, we've done the finite element analysis on that and it breaks. Oh, no, gee, we've got 30 in Sweden and they're all doing fine. You put in five for us while we evaluate your system. And of course, I didn't realize then because I was naive that they were uh, trying to shelve it. And indeed, two of the implants that I put in did crack. Um, one very delightful lady said, Mr. Knight, uh, phoned me from Devon, said, Mr. Knight, I've just used a five iron. Uh, I'm, 
uh, am I supposed to have had a click in my hip? It was very sad. So um, I've been cautious about what the Americans say since. And um, then my one of my strange events happened in the department. The two bosses who liked what I was doing, one retired and the other suddenly died. The person who didn't like me was my was another boss. He became the head of the department and life was made absolute hell. Um, and even today I find it difficult to talk about, but uh, I realized I wanted to be a surgeon very, very much. And I was not going to get kicked out or whatever. And the Southampton consultants very kindly put me forwards to join the Navy, which I did. And I had five really interesting years, but it was rather a constrained environment. But uh, I went obviously to Hasler and Stonehouse in those days and worked as an orthopedic surgeon and then did my Armada patrol, which was fascinating, uh, rendering assistance to merchantmen as they went up and down and some were filled with cannon and we had some fun with all of that. And then I had to go do a sneaky and then swim out and uh, dive down into a submarine. And when we landed at Dubai, the lads came along and said, oh, Doc, uh, we've got a problem. We've got a dead body between the ship and the port side. And of course, the ship is moored up beside the port and is very, very dark. And we would the team would go around every four hours to make sure nobody left a limpet mine on. So I went down and I into the dark and I it was quite deep and um, I felt this body and it was smooth and I thought, oh boy, we've got an international incident here. And it was only with um, a, a bit more feel that I came across these horns and it doesn't do to swear under water at that depth but I roasted the lads when I got aboard. So um, I came out of the Navy, went north and uh, worked in Rochdale and Manchester and then also in Huddersfield. And I thought I was going to have a lovely life, you know, being an orthopod and doing, uh, you know, playing golf, whatever that is. And unfortunately, my predecessor was a very good surgeon, but he left behind a track record of failed back surgery and I thought wow um, the weaponry we had to hand were four main operations micro discectomy decompression laminectomy and fusion which we'll talk about in a moment and you'll see this is the sort of uh, somewhat medieval equipment that uh, we used to wield and what on earth should we do I didn't think that I could do better than my predecessor, and if I operated, I would leave this sort of track record behind. So let's now look at spinal anatomy and a little bit more at the surgical treatments available. Um, I've been very circumspect because I thought Lindy would have my uh, certain organs for uh, dinner if um, I put in any really upsetting videos, but I will warn you if there's a couple which are interesting. So a little bit of anatomy. I hope you can see this. That's the spinous process. That's the bit you scratch when you feel your back and emanating from that to the side are laminae and they're there to protect your spine from flying spears and between these laminae are big thick ligaments called the yellow ligaments because they are and in the spinal space there is a water jacket carrying all the nerves down to your legs and they come out at each level as you'll see here in red and these are the facet joints at the back which allow you to move in certain directions in the lumbar spine it tends to be you tending to lean forwards or backwards not quite so much rotation you get the rotation in other ways but you get some so let's look at um, the anatomy a little bit more. The disc has about 26 layers of thick uh, material, thick fibrous material, and a softer uh, gel-like center. This animation doesn't show you that that gel moves both forwards 
and backwards as the um, as the unit moves, as the segment moves. It also doesn't show you that this is an asymmetrical movement pattern, but it gives you the vague idea. So wear and tear occurs in the disc, probably genetic, because the drivers from within the cell don't keep the little uh, cells working properly. And then the wall of the disc bulges like a tire and then presses onto the nerve. And you're going to hear me say this several times. The concept is in most spine surgeons that the pain in the back comes from the disc or the facet joints. And therefore they seek to immobilize it. And as the discs wear, so you get slippage forwards or indeed backwards of the one vertebra upon another, which distorts the doorway and crimps the nerve. So it's getting unhappy and angry there. So when the disc bulges, um, that'll go on running. So we then have to get rid of this bulge. I hope you can see that because some of your lovely faces are covering it, but there we go. This is an animation, so there's no blood, of a micro discectomy. And you'll see that a micro discectomy is not micro. It's just that it uses a microscope. And you can tell I'm a bigot in that statement. And there's the nerve being unhappily compressed by the combination of, say, the facet joint and the disc protrusion. So we need to whittle that bone away with a power drill, turning at about 14,000 revs, and then move the inflamed nerve to one side, and then put this huge instrument in, making sure you don't damage the nerve, and then take out the offending disc, and you put graspers in, and we've all been taught to take out as much disc as possible, which is wrong, because you you expedite the degeneration. So the next operation is a laminectomy. Remember that these are the laminae and we're going to, ectomy means to take away, so we're going to take away that lamina and the adjacent bone in order that we can give the water jacket breathing space. Now here, this is real surgery here, just to show you the difference between reality and the nice, neat little animation. And this is a friend of mine from India, um, working away here. He's going, working his way down by the spines to um, get to the lamina. And then if you're thinking of how you divvy up your Sunday joint, uh, he's taking off the bone here of the spinous process. And then he's going to take away the bone of the lamina. You see him taking it away there with the drill. And sorry if that's a little bit redder, but you can look at, I see one lady's looking away. I'm so sorry. It, there's no real blood there, it's just raspberry sauce. Um, and um, there is a combination of uh, bone spur and disc, and he's going to cut into that little area and precisely remove it and stitch up, because patients don't like to walk home with a wound open. Let's just move that on. So let's now move just two animations here for fusion. I was saying to you a bit earlier that my colleagues believe very much in immobilizing the disc. So you can come at this from the back. So you can go in and work your way through. You can either just put these screws in and uh, take away the, the, the lamina and the facet joint or doing it more securely you go into the disc you take out the disc material and you put in a 
a cage on either side and you fill that cage with some of the bone you've just removed. I wish it was as simple as that. Um, and of course, you then expect this all to solidify. The trouble being that if you immobilize bones, you slow down the drivers that cause the bones to unite. So one of the problems with the surgery, apart from damaging nerves and so on, is that it doesn't unite. And you can come at this a different way. You can come at this from the front. And as you can imagine, you have to make sure you leave the aorta and vena cava intact. It's OK at 5S1, but at this level, but at levels higher, it's a jolly sight more difficult. And you whittle away the disc and you put in the implant with the bone and hopefully Bob's your uncle. So I mean, there's, and just to show you that what you were looking at here, in actual fact, is a little bit more raspberry sauce than um, you might have th thought. So what about a new way? That was the established way. Well, I thought it's got to be safer. It's got to have less collateral damage to all those tissues. And if you remember looking at the microdiscectomy, you could see how even there the, the color of the muscle had changed from red to blue uh, because it was not happy and it had dried out. And we need to be better targeted in finding the source of the pain and get better outcomes. Now we all stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, Hijikata in 75 in Japan was going into the disc with a little tube from the side door and taking out the disc manually. And he kept every single disc that he ever took out in a glass cabinet, amazing. And a friend of mine called Dan Choi was using a homium fiber, homium yag fiber, uh, sorry, a neodymium yag fiber, which is a bit dangerous. It has quite a long depth of penetration in water up to, you know, some, 12 centimeters. So he and I used to argue a bit about that and I thought that might be a better way of doing it. But his concept was if you vaporize the bad bit in, in the disc, you'll reduce the pressure on the disc protrusion. And there was merit in that. Parvis Cambin in Washington was going in with uh, an endoscope on either side, but just taking out the disc at the front. Uh, sorry, taking disc out and causing more collapse in that disc segment. But he very cleverly sort of defined something called the safe triangle, the Cambin triangle, which we all use to this day. And then, funny enough, you've got one of these clusters that happens in evolution. Sango Lee in Korea, Tony Young in the States, me, Tom Hoogland, all were coming up with different ways of trying to do the endoscopic discectomy from one side. And then I felt that that had limitations and we went on to develop foraminoplasty, uh, which we'll talk about. So back with our anatomy, let's now turn to the direction that we're going to go in, namely, if you can see this point, and we're going to go in through the side door. So the first thing is to try and get the diagnosis a bit better because there was a lot of fail, fail back surgery around. And one of the things being used was discography, but people were using discography, which is to put dye into the disc to produce uh, a pressure testing because they felt that the disc was the source of the pain. They hadn't taken on board the disc as you bulge it out was actually then pressing on the nerve and you got a positive result if the discography happened to press on the nerve or make that pressure worse. And you'll see here, this one's leaking. This one, they talk about a hamburger effect, but this one has got um, a bulge coming out onto this side. It's degenerating. And this one is a healthier disc, 
but definitely degenerating to the side and backwards. But MRI scans came along with fortitude at that time. They showed all sorts of pathology. We didn't know, of course, then how long the pathology had been present and which was really relevant, especially when you get to our sort of age that there's going to be pathology at three, four, five levels. And then on top of that, the wiring is irregular. It's anomalous in about 15% of cases. So when you think you're dealing with an S1 nerve, or the nerve that comes below L5, S1, or the L5 nerve that comes out between L5 and S1, you may be wrong. You may be dealing with the L4 nerve, just depending on how you're wired up both inside the spine and in the plexuses that occur outside. So what I stumbled into was that now I'm operating on patients awake, which was actually quite a big step because nobody else was doing that. Um, patients could tell me if I was dealing with the right level. So I was then going to reduce guesstimation and hopefully reduce uh, fail back surgery. But questioning the very principles of spinal diagnosis started to raise hackles certainly amongst the academic fraternity. So I was going to be in for trouble. So um, we operate on the patients prone and we were going to start off by doing laser discectomy, but not quite like Daniel was doing. Come along, where are you? That's great, sorry guys. I was using a KTP uh, sidefire laser. Why the devil is that not working? Isn't that frustrating? Oh well, um, you'll just see the probe coming in here and it's sidefire so I could make sure the energy just went into the area where the disc wall was weak. It could shrink the deep the, the wall just from the heat effect on those fibers as well as vaporizing the baddies in the disc and of course we put a blue dye in the disc which was picked up by the degenerate material only and the laser then vaporized that. So um, we had um, an 80 percent success rate in the first 50 patients we did it in providing the disc had a broad base. But um, I met the first problem that the local professor was not very pleased. He wanted all the research to take place in his unit uh, 20 miles, 10, 15 miles away. Uh, he then threatened our hospital management with the CQC coming in or the CQC equivalent to monitor my progress and he also then went ahead and withheld any junior trainees in orthopaedics from coming aboard which of course meant all the consultants had to work even harder and so that may be out of joint even with my friends there. Um, the only way we could handle that was to establish the charity called the Spinal Foundation and Jenny and I have worked pro bono for that for over 20 years but it took the patients out of their local NHS hospital because they could do that in those days. And, and um, we were able to treat NHS patients for free. So um, just dealing with broad-based bulges wasn't nearly enough. There's a whole host of other problems in the spine. And that was why we started to work on endoscopic using a endoscopes a telescope as you know it's a little tiny slim thing and we would dilate the tissues on the way down to the disc through that doorway and then replace the dilator with the endoscope and take out the disc protrusion and that was good for slip discs 
uh, and you can see it was a little hole of six millimeters that uh, plasters in totally the wrong position, but never mind. Um, and endoscopic intradiscal discectomy was born. We then went into the disc and took the bulge into the disc and then out through the side door. So we never went into the spine. But to do this, we hadn't got instruments in those days. We had to develop our end endoscope and get it CE marked. Uh, we did manage to sell it around the world um, to about 300 surgeons. And here you'll see one of the uh, forms. And we made an elliptical scope with a, in a round tube, which gave us extra means of irrigating. But um, as the rather interesting results started to be published, um, there was a counter move where Nottingham came forward from the professor there. So I was getting blasted everywhere. Um, uh, saying that this approach to the spine was just totally dangerous. And then, when it came to be known that I was using this side fire laser, you can imagine all hell broke loose. Operation Especially Grand Slam, for instance. when people were watching this sort of video. Jack has got words to say about this. <laughs> it does tend to focus the mind. Two words you may have overheard, which cannot possibly have any significance to you or anyone in your organization. Can you afford to take that chance? And can you see the immediacy of control there that you can cut that laser off? Absolutely, so sorry. Absolutely immediately. So it was side fire, it was directly under vision, you had immediate control, and it would cut into soft tissue if you sustained the laser to a depth of 0.4 millimeters and in bone to 0.2. That was far more accurate than I could achieve with a knife. But the hounds were out and a different a friend of the first <laughs> professor then became the chairman of the GMC conduct committee. And he put my name forwards to the interim orders committee and got me suspended for three months. So uh, suspended from looking after NHS patients and obviously no private practice either. So that was painful. But 20 months later, I was exonerated and actually commended. I'm sorry, it sounds a bit big headed, but it's because I'm so angry about it still commended for the contribution we were trying to make towards spinal surgery. Now, here we are going down into the spine. And there's a lovely thing. I wish everything was an animation that you get down here and the yellow is the disc and there's your doorway. But this is what you actually see when you get down there. And here's the front border of the facet joint coming up to here. Across here is a thick ligament called the superior foraminal ligament, which spine surgeons never see. And here is the nerve. And you can see how red and unhappy it is because it's inflamed from being bruised by the facet joint and impinged on by this ligament. But here, as we were touching the inside of the patient, there you'll see the blue disc, stained blue. I didn't get the chance to work on royalty. This is the nerve, and you'll see there the superior foraminal ligament. And it often gets bound to the nerve and sometimes calcified. And as you lose height in the disc, so uh, those factors all start to crowd the nerve and give rise to pain. So whilst the annulus, so sorry, the wall of the disc can cause local pain, it only does so if the disc is inflamed. So the basic concept of foraminoplasty was being formed 
um, and it showed from our findings that the MRI scans were oft, well, quite often, worryingly often, misleading. So here's that superior foraminal ligament, uh, the impacting facet joint. Oh, Jack, quiet. I'm telling the truth. No. Nerve, uh, there's tethering between the nerve here and the wall of the disc and the nerve and the facet joint and then you may get uh, scarring caused by repetitive irritation or unfortunately by our by previous surgery so um i've lost one person just run out of the room so here's the laser now vaporizing the scar as it does so it, it uh, does so bloodlessly and then cut back the ligament and then in more recent times we've developed more instruments so we were able to now mobilize the nerve and the trick was if you're doing this on the kitchen table on a Sunday make sure you get the pulsatility back in that nerve. If you've done that, then you have cleared it enough. And so we cleared away bone spurs that occurred there with the rema and now over cut back the facet joint. The facet joint gets big and thick and spiky because it's arthritic. And then having cleared the way, um, go into the disc. And sometimes I don't go in the disc because the disc is already uh, non-contributory. It's all the getting the nerve free that matters. Why damage something that's already damaged further? But that's um, not a universal opinion. So here's this very simple form of um, endoscopic discectomy with a, um, without really doing the full foraminoplasty or foraminotomy. And here's um, an Indian surgeon, very good, doing the discectomy manually with uh, uh, those are graspers. And I don't want to put you off your future meals, but the disc is very akin to crab meat. Um, I've never actually tasted it, but it behaves as such. And you'll see a rather shaking motion that the surgeon's going to employ, I hope, uh, because you need just to do that to make the degenerate bit come out. And there is the bad bit of disc out. There's the nerve. And you'll see how white that is because it's been an acute disc protrusion. But there's a ridge there, and that's we call osteophytes, and that would still persist in the front of the nerve if you didn't do this technique. And it's one of the reasons that conventional surgery through the midline fails because they can't treat that. So I've actually reduced that portal that you are seeing there um, from five millimeters to three, which actually halves the area of the hole and reduces the chance of subsequent extrusion. So this now is the, the, the tail end of the foraminoplasty here. I haven't quite cleared the superior foraminal ligament. You'll see above you the bone that I've whittled away with the laser at this stage, or maybe burrs. This here, I'm sorry, it's a bit fuzzy, is the nerve. And I'm working into the epidural space there the dura is above us gosh that isn't looking very good is it so very streaky but you can see this is a very gentle procedure done this way and i'm pleased to see that other surgeons are beginning to do it more this way now uh, and i've undercut that so pulsatility is restored into the nerve you can go into the epidural space and uh, until you get free fat. 
and you can resect the superior foraminal ligament. So I'm sorry this is getting a little bit technical, but we'll move off this. Uh, this is just to show you how terribly angry and unhappy the nerve gets. It should be white, as you saw in that earlier picture. And here's the superior foraminal ligament cut back, and now epidural fat is coming through to protect this nerve. But sometimes we come across things that shouldn't be there. When some of my friends have been putting screws into people to do their fusion, they don't get it right, and they don't under they seem to think the patient's having them on when they complain of pain so having cleared away all the scar here we came across this nerve which that's uh, this screw and once it was cleared we were able to remove the screw and the patient was better and here is a tear in the disc wall all right you might not think that's very important but the contents of the disc are highly irritant and so they come out and they jet jet onto the nerve and cause an awful lot of pain in a group of patients, not in everybody. So, of course, the scan is an inert, inert evaluation. Please work. Ah! That is really annoying. Is working fine today. Uh, what it sh this is a dynamic CT scan, and you'll see here the osteophytes, the bone spurs, and you'll see here the doorway where the nerve comes out. And at this level, it's hinging because these two levels are very inert uh, because they've lost their contents. And here, the doorways have been crimped down and distorted and the poor old nerves really suffering. So the immobility of an MRI scan hides the dynamic dynamics of the problem. Uh, the facet joints override, so they move up relative to the one that descends and starts to crimp the nerve. And then the shoulder osteophytes dig into the nerve and scarring develops, and that's underestimated by the scan. And then you get the trapped nerve. And you can't detect that. There are little things that we are working on on the AI that we think do show, give us a clue as to when that is happening, but that's a different talk. So here, here is a patient who's had a fusion, and look at that spike because there was once upon a time a fracture through this bone occurring when the person was a child. And this doorway is very, very small. So again, going in with the telescope through one hole, two levels, we were able to help this patient. And you can see here, this is um, a more senior spine, an 82 year old lady who's got a scoliosis um, you'll, she had weakness on the right, which is this side, and searing pain in the thigh on the left. So what do you do? Because it's jolly difficult to do two-sided operations. And she had weakness on the right, and she had a disc protrusion at this level on the right. So you'll see here the osteophytes are bridged across and the joint is overgrown. Here uh, you've got the rim osteophytes digging into the nerve and this disc has got air in it, it's got gas in it and you can, it's diminished. And at these two levels the doorway is desperately crimped. So what we did is came in with the telescope, opened up those doorways came across the inside of the disc at this level, took out the disc protrusion and took it that way, and in fact put a gel in, which I mean I had discussed with her because it's not often done at this age because the bones can be small, uh, rather thin, but it's worked really rather well, and she now still walks a mile a day. So um, the treatment now seen as an overall, it allows you to target by 
the, the pain source by foraminal probing. The importance of nerve tethering and impaction and irritation is paramount. Um, and it's good for all ages, from working age to senior patients, and especially those with comorbidities. So, sorry this is a little bit heavy, this slide, but you'll see that we can treat patients with MS, strokes, Parkinsonism, blood disorders. We had one patient who was just a few weeks after a coronary. Um, diabetes, venous thrombosis, arachnoiditis. And then, because we're going for the source of the pain, we can treat a panoply, almost all of the uh, degenerative conditions that appertain to the spine. And in, we've done about 11,000 uh, interventions over the last 30 years, and we'll look just a little lightly at the outcomes, because you'll wonder why the devil we're doing it. So the results from the laser discectomy in the first 388 was 50% good or better. And we are very circumspect about our definitions here. Uh, three to nine years later, when they were evaluated, we had three patients who had a, a non-infected discitis and 2% two recurrent, two recurrent prolapse. And with the foraminoplasty, uh, with the multi-pathology grouping that we used, 80% good results at two to four years. And in the complications review, a 2% complications rate, of which half were recurrence. And then looking at the long term, because 10 years is a, a long study, um, we had 72% good results. So if we can get the patient better, most of them hold it, which is really great. And because we've been using this much smaller hole into the disc, we've been looking at um, the last 800 patients we've done. And these are, again, very encouraging results. But back now to the other theme of the dirty tricks. They say that medics make... Um, even better uh, parliamentarians than uh, the real thing. Uh, they're very strategically acute. So um, one of the things which, you, which was started to happen to us was that certain people were trying to increase, uh, get, get patients to sue me basically, and because they sat on boards of the indemnity organizations, they would say that we were terribly dangerous. Um, they stopped me from bringing patients into certain hospitals. They stopped trainees coming to attend my teaching courses. They got onto BUPA and PPP where they use external advisors and told them not to refer patients. Uh, they sat on grant giving committees and stopped the Spinal Foundation getting the grants needed to do the randomized controlled studies. And they directly misinformed NICE. NICE never came to us originally to ask us for our results. They went to people who never didn't know one end of an endoscope from another. And of course, if NICE doesn't support it, then the CCGs won't allow pay, won't pay for patients to be treated within the NHS. So you may think that it, you might not have any idea of the time frame it takes to develop a new technique, and nor did I really when I started, I have to admit. But it took, say, about two years to develop the technique, get the instruments and get the hang and get of the technique and the learning curve. Then we embarked upon a prospective study. Now, to do that, you have to have national ethics permission. You have to get the permission of the CEO from the hospital and the MAC. And then you have to find some funds. So the research committees will only give money to cover the cost of somebody who's doing the analysis. The CCGs have to bear the brunt of um, paying for the operation. And the hospitals have to get additional funding because they may say they have to have other nurses or something to take on this workload. 
So it takes you two years to recruit, um, two years to re until review date and an analysis year. So that's five years gone. Two years to try and get future funding for the pilot randomized control study because they say, oh, well, we don't know how many patients you need to have in the study to do a, a, a reasonable comparison. So you have to do a pilot that takes five years. Then more funding rounds, seven years to roll out the full randomized control study. And then nice, don't start to look at your results immediately. They're much more interested in COVID, of course. So it may take them two to three years to pontificate. And then they may say, oh, we may want more than one randomized study from another center, which I can understand, but it does mean that you've notched up 27 years before you've really got the technique accepted. And in the meantime, my patients suffer. Um, it ruins their lifestyle, as you see with this young man, ruins their family life. It impoverishes winning workers like this man. And Andy, you probably can't see it because the fa our faces are in the way, but he is decrying being unsupported and the fact his girlfriend has left him because he became such a crabby pain ridden chap and I and his fascinating fellow but he's a good bloke and we did help him but um, it's, it was a long story <laughs> so what have we learnt from this technique well for aminoplasty isn't just an operation it's a complete paradigm you start to operate on the patients awake to evaluate their pain with them awake and they lead you to the source of the pain and they dictate the intervention on the operating table. The feedback shows that the nerve is the main source of back and leg pain rather than the disc. The nerve is therefore the primary treatment target, not the disc. And it does address the needs of a wide range of problems and ages and uh, comorbidities and of course fail back surgery um, it preserves physiological movement so the post-operative physiotherapy is really the other half of this op this paradigm and I'll talk to you some other time about combination for aminoplasty but this is the sort of joy of and why one struggles I think to try and move things forwards. This lady was just bed to chair, chair to bed, and now she's walking. And this delightful lady, she's still got a scoliosis and offset, but she sent me this picture to say, I'm back in my garden, and I do understand. So just wrapping up a bit now, pleased to know, uh, suggestions. I think the government should allow innovation to take place in the centers with experience, especially where they've developed it. Give research committees the full funding to, to point at a technique and say, go to it, do the randomized control study. And the NHS has become, and as you've seen this with COVID, hugely bureaucratic, hugely over-centralized, and that's got to be limited. And by all means, do very intense in-field uh, monitoring and auditing unlink the hold that academic centres are having on new ideas coming forwards and the government needs to look at their funding strategy in a different way, not looking at it for one year, look at the benefits of this technique which would save them thousands and thousands of pounds. I mean this is why now Vupa like it because it saves them money because they don't have so many complications and it's a relatively cheap operation and allow spinal surgeons to adopt this new paradigm, be guided by the pain, not the guesstimate, treat precisely and um, kill over cue. And finally, this is where we're at at the present, where the majority of surgeons in this country are still doing discectomy, fusion, total disc replacement and the laminectomy, all of which are unphysiological. 
Around the world now, we have a thousand surgeons in India, and it's widely been performed in the United States, Mexico, Brazil, and all of those countries. And the future is greatly assisted by this technique because it doesn't do any harm and allows you to bridge the gap to get into the spine so we can rebuild the spine with stem cells, gels, gene modification, and thereby control degeneration. I would counsel you to think as this young escapee and um, the gremlins have got in again, which I found fascinating, but for, I was going to show you there the, the real foraminoplasty. We could do that perhaps some other time, but thank you for listening. I'm sorry that it's been an hour um, and another time we can look at the blue horizons and cluneal nerves and instrumentation that we've developed and the future instrumentation of the Medusa scope. Thank you all very much.